Yeah. I know. Is that Kevin? Pray. Our Lord and our God, as we come into this house, help us to be prepared to be worshipful, to lift our hearts, to lift our minds, to lift our very beings to you. For you are the King of glory. And all glory and honor is yours. It's in the name of Jesus the Christ that we pray. Amen. The triune God of grace welcomes you this morning to his house. And I greet you in his powerful name. few announcements this morning. Um, first, uh, a hearty 
Thank you to all those who, um, who participated last night in Coffee House, be it setup, tech, um, performances, food preparation, and of course, um, those folks who sat out there and enjoyed good food and good time and good fellowship. So a big thank you, it uh, was a success. Uh, the bridge. A reminder that the bridge program began last week. Um, it's, it's in its second week. It begins at 11 o'clock today. Um, kids are signed up um, over in, um, in Pearson Hall, but then um, it goes up to the annex. At the same time, down the hall in the community room, parents uh, are welcome to come uh, as we just talk about practical faith um, in the 21st century. Handbell Choir and Chancel Choir, Thursday evening rehearsals. Um, if you are interested, they're still taking all comers. So, um, you know, consider coming on Thursday evening for those rehearsals. If you want to talk to Debbie, talk to Debbie after worship today if you are interested. Um, we are collecting toiletries for, uh, for Family Promise, shampoo, conditioner, deodorant, toothpaste, I think this is gonna be coming to an end here in the next week or so, so we do have a box in the narthex, but you can drop things off in the office as well. Uh, a save the date moment here, and that is for October 30, Saturday, October 30th at 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. across the street in the parking lot across the street. Uh, Trunk or Treat is making its return. It will be a little bit different this year. There won't be car decorations, but there will be plenty of fun and costumes are welcome. Last but not least, um, so that I can fulfill all righteousness because I actually forgot last week. Um, we are um, giving a moment uh, each Sunday to introduce or have them introduce to you themselves um, one of you know, our elders. So today... I will let you. I will let him introduce himself. But um, as we start uh, with our elders, good morning. Um, my name is Fred Orlando. I am the co-chair of the membership council. Um, I am the youngest member of the Chestnut Orlando McDonough family. <laughs> and if you would like to call me younger instead of elder, I would not oppose it. Thank you. <laughs> For those of you who didn't um, understand quite the reference, okay, we have three generations of a family that sits usually right around down here, and that would be the Chestnuts, and then it, it bred forth the McDonough's and the Orlando's, and that is what he's talking about. For those of you who might be novices to that, I, on the other hand, just on, I'm, on Friday night, I am officially now a charter member of the Chestnut family. Because I've done, I've, I just, seems like, gosh, I'm waiting for the next stuff. Maybe baptisms and who knows. We'll see. <laughs> Let us hear from our Lord Jesus Christ from the Gospel of Matthew. As he reminds us of what he will eventually tell the disciples before he ascends when he says, I will be with you till the end of the time. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Let us stand and let us worship God.
The Apostle Paul tells, uh, tells us, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. 
and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Creator of life, the universe, and everything. Creator of the seasons of the years. Lord, we welcome in the autumn season that you have brought. We welcome in a new season of life. You walk before us in the seasons. You walk behind us in the seasons. You walk with us through each season. We stop and we recognize today that you are ever present through your Holy Spirit. That you have been ever present in all time. Indeed, Lord, you created time. For you, Time is a creation. 
For us, time can be a trap. So Lord, on this day, on this first Sunday of a new season, a beautiful day, incredible blue sky and fast-moving clouds, flowers of orange and rust and reds and yellows. We just give glory to the King of creation. That same creator created each and every one of us and knows what's on each and every heart. Celebrations of joy, births of new children, families growing up, weddings, celebrations of life, Lord. But we also recognize that you know what's on our hearts when we are anxious and afraid, when we are not well, and as we struggle. You were there in all of it. Every moment, every day. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us that you have said, I will be with you always till the end of the day. Lord, we are gathered as one people, as the body of Christ, for which you, Lord Jesus, are the head. And as we are gathered here, we join our hearts and we join our voices as we pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, as we offer our lives to our Lord Jesus Christ, as we walk alongside Him in ministry, as we do that, we submit to Him and we submit to one another. We are the church of Jesus Christ and together we do His ministry. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another. Dead left and dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. Should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I will bow to the things of this world. And I Should I ever need reminders?
is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things I've seen and this reckoning. Lord and our God, we offer up our very lives to you. Take the produce of our lives that we have presented to this church so that we may do useful and real ministry in your holy name. As you walk alongside us, help us to recognize that. And we pray this in the name of the Lamb that was slain, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Excuse me, Mr. Palmer, you have a box for me. And obviously your Patriots jersey is in the laundry. Oh, hi, Scott. Thank you, sir. Oh, it's heavy. They are, they're getting quick, they're quicker today. Here they come. Won't be long, Mrs. Washer, before you're carrying two of them, right? I know. Ay, ay, ay. October, right? Like this week. Like this week. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> like hopefully. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Pass the pat. She out. Oh, you're smoozing me now, aren't you? Your sister had you though. She was she was quicker out of the chute and much louder. Let's try this again. Good morning. Good morning. You're a man after my own heart. Let's see what we got here. Does it, does it work? Yes. Is there somebody in the room that has the other one? No. no. That would have been fun, Jim. You know that, right? That would have been fun. We could have been talking back and forth. So this is actually, I, I can turn it off now because it's beeping at me. You guys all know what this is, right? Yeah. It's a walkie-talkie. 
I thought maybe you had lost touch with reality because, you know, there was a time when these were very, very handy and it was like right around the time that um, cell phones were coming in and then these seemed to go away because now everybody can walk around doing this and they worship their little cell phones. But it's about communication. And there are many, many forms of communication. There are folks in, in this church sitting here right now who come from a letter writing generation. Then the generation after them started writing long emails. And then my generation came along, and if you're, you lose me after the third bullet point. And then you have another generation here, they don't even know what an email is. Because they talk with things like LOL and FAQ. LMAO. Some of these I don't even know because I come from a generation where you had to have something done ASAP. <laughs> but it's about communication and it's about how we talk and how we interact. And we've been interacting as a church, not this specific church, but as Jesus' church for 2,000 years. And some of the greatest communicators are people like the Apostle Paul I just read from. And the Apostle Peter, they wrote some great stuff, but we're studying church history on Wednesday nights and we hear from really, really cool people like, okay, Kathy, what, what's my favorite word, the favorite name? Remember from the other night? Polycarp. Polycarp. He was a great communicator and he wrote lots of stuff. See, we, we need to communicate and tell the story. We need to tell the story of how Jesus is in our lives, how God works in our lives. And we need to learn how to tell that story, and we need to tell it over and over and perfect that story, because interestingly enough, as our story grows, his story in us grows. We're not supposed to just profess faith and say, I believe in Jesus, and then stop right there. That's just the beginning. The story always grows. So it's all about communication. So I would have, had we had it on the other end, sent a story upstairs. But I'm telling you that Jesus loves us and he grows us and he grows in us. Always, always talk back to him through prayer. Because sometimes that's the best way to grow is to have a conversation. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're talking to you right now. And we know you're talking to us. Lord, help us to just listen as much as we speak to you. Two-way communication, Lord. For you are the Lord of our lives. It is your history that is being written and we are woven into your history. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 All right, walkie-talkie back. Is this what they call them now? Walkie-talkies, right? They still do that? Yeah. See, back in, back, in, back in your father's day, he used to have a, probably a big one about this big when he played army out in the yard, right, Jen? Yeah, me too. I had them too. All right, let's see. Young Master Shawl. Huh? We're going to send it home with the shawls. And we're also hoping and praying that number two comes this week. Yep. Now, all of you, get out of here. So as we continue to journey um, with the Hebrew people in the wilderness, as they are following the leadership of Moses, 
But also, more importantly, they're led by fire, by the presence of God. They're also backed up by the presence of God. Here now, as Moses receives more instructions. And when Moses went into the tent of the meeting to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the ark of the testimony, from between the two cherubim, and it spoke to him. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and say to him, When you set up lamps, the seven lamps shall give light in front of the lampstand. And Aaron did so. He set up its lamps in front of the lampstand as the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take the Levites from among the people of Israel and cleanse them. Thus you shall separate the Levites from among the people of Israel, and the Levites shall be mine. And after that, the Levites shall go in and serve at the tent of meeting when you have cleansed them and offered them as a wave offering. For they are wholly given to me from among the people of Israel. Instead of all who opened the womb, the firstborn of all the people of Israel, I have taken them. For myself. Note heavy today, so I need to have it out here. So, one of the things that we learn from the early church when it comes to Scripture, and when we hear even from those who were writing two centuries in how much they understood that the Old Testament scriptures, that these scrolls that had been handed down for centuries, how they understood these things as being precursors, and how they understood them in the light of the fact that Jesus has come, Jesus has done his work, Jesus has died on the cross, Jesus has resurrected, and Jesus has ascended into heaven. The presence of God that had come to them they saw all the Old Testament scriptures as making the point that this is what was expected. This was what was meant to come. Jesus was foretold all the way back. So by the time you get to Moses, by the time you get to these people in the wilderness, they've been told now for almost a thousand years between the original words to Abraham, your descendants will be like the stars, and that out of, out of you the nations, all the nations, shall be transformed. To his grandson, Jacob, who has these 12 sons, and when he goes to give the blessings to the sons, it is the second son, Judah, who gets this special blessing that that God is going to do something special, that the scepter is never going to leave from the hand of Judah, from his descendants. So something special has been brewing. And then things seem to go silent after Joseph and his brothers have settled in Egypt. Something seems to be silent for a long time and then all of a sudden in the midst of it, as the people are crying out, the people are crying out because they, they're for a deliverer, for a savior, for a rescuer. God does it again. God gives another promise. But the promise comes in the form of a person. Not a fulfillment of the promise, but a foreshadowing of the one that will come. A little boy is born. And that little boy is born under the threat of death. And he's placed by his sister in a river where he's plucked from the river by Pharaoh's daughter. And he's raised in Pharaoh's house. 
how unique that a Hebrew, a servant class, a slave class, would be raised in the house of Pharaoh. He learns all the things that you would learn in the school of Pharaoh. But then, a turn of events that casts him out of Egypt. And he disappears into the wilderness where he becomes a sheep herder. But then he's confronted by God on a mountain. Moses returns with orders from the great I Am that he's going to deliver his people, that he's going to bring them out And he does. But it's not Moses I want to focus on. You see, Moses had a brother. Moses had an older brother. He was approximately three years older than Moses. His name was Aaron. And Aaron, I think, is God showing us what it means to be a faithful follower of God. A broken faithful follower of God, but a faithful follower of God. You see, because Moses needed a wingman. Moses had some sort of a speech impediment or was a stutterer, and he needed somebody who was going to speak on behalf of Moses, who was speaking on behalf of God. So it's like a translation thing. So he says to Moses, I'm giving you your brother. Your brother will be at your side. He will walk along with you. And he will interpret these saving acts, these these, these rescuing acts. He's going to interpret that for the people. And sure enough, side by side, the brothers lead the people out. Moses, always the front man. Aaron, always the second So when Moses goes up onto the mountain and receives the law, God already has in place what he's going to do with what what he's going to do with the tribe of Levi, for which Moses and Aaron are from, the tribe of Levi. There's already a plan in God's mind, and it will fall into place. So let me tell you Aaron, though. Let's talk about Aaron. Let's see what we can find out about Aaron. But it's going to be from Aaron's point of view. If Aaron were talking to us today, what are some of the things that he would tell you? Well, first of all, you got to put sibling rivalry away. you got to put that away. Okay? Aaron understood that Moses was always going to be the lead. Even though he was his younger brother, he understood that. Moses is always going to be in the lead. Aaron would tell us that Jesus will always be in the lead for us. Jesus is in the lead. We can't be Jesus. We can't be God. As much as we try, we can't be. And boy, do we try. But there can't be sibling rivalry. We have to understand what our place is as Christians. Because remember, Paul calls us a priesthood of all believers. Okay? That's going to come in handy here to help us understand this. But right now, let's just sit with the fact that we've, when you've professed faith, that Jesus is always out front. Always. We are always to be back. We're to be humble. We're to recognize that we have a role and that we're called to that role, that God has chosen us for that role, but we have a role that is not out front. It's always in the background. Sibling rivalry. Let's move on to another one. Aaron tells us that you need to always listen to God's voice first. 
God's voice first, not the world's voice, not the crowd's voice, God's voice. And then see what God's doing in the crowd, but don't listen to the crowd's voice and forget to listen to God's voice. Case in point, our friend Aaron would tell you that one day he really blew it. You see, Moses had gone up onto Mount Sinai to receive the law. And Moses has been delayed. Moses has gone on a little longer than he needs to be. And the people, in classic Hebrew fashion, they're grumbling. They're grumbling because Moses hasn't come back. He must be dead. He must be gone. He must have forgotten us. I don't know. But they decide, well, enough with the Moses thing. Let's move on. Aaron, we want a God to worship. This is like the no-win scenario. In Star Trek, we would call this the Kobayashi Maru. It's the no-win scenario. The mob is telling Aaron, we want a God to worship. What does Aaron do? Bring me the gold that you brought out of Egypt. And he melts it down. And he makes a cow. He makes a golden cow so that they could worship. He makes an idol. Little does he know that Moses is going to be coming down the mountain. And when he comes down the mountain, the very first two commandments, you will not worship another god, and you will not make graven images of gods that you will bow down and worship. Poor Aaron has just stumbled on the first two commandments, and they haven't even been given to him yet. Moses comes down the mountain and finds the revelry around the golden calf. I like cow better. But they're worshiping this thing. They have forgotten Moses. They have forgotten God. They've forgotten the whole scenario. They've forgotten who took them out of Egypt and out of slavery. God makes this a physical representation of what happens when you do worship other gods. He destroys some of those very same mob that had called for another god. Now, there are people out there, including uh, there was a man in the second century by the name of Marcion, who said, well, that's just not fair. That's an angry god. That's not the god of Jesus. Let's believe that. No. God has a righteous holiness, and God has an anger because they didn't follow. But here's the point Aaron would tell you, though. But God has mercy. God has grace. God has love. Why? Because Aaron is still standing there when the dust is settling. And not only is he still standing there, but God turns around and tells Moses, there's going to be the high priest. Think about that for a second. The guy who melted down all the gold, made a giant cow, and was leading these people in worship, has now been made the high priest. From sin to holiness. Aaron would tell you that you need to be true to God's voice. Don't listen to the mob. Listen to God. This obviously caused Aaron to self-reflect. How could you go through that without him doing some self-reflection? How could he do this if he did not seek forgiveness from God or at least assurance that he was forgiven. God chose him to be a priest, and that has got to be humbling. As Paul would tell us, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So therefore, what ends up happening is there's this whole thing of, okay, we're all in this together. We're a white-hot mess. We're all a bunch of sinners, but God can choose us. 
Peter would tell us that we are a priesthood of all believers. So all of a sudden, we are elevated to that same level as Christians as Aaron and his sons and the Levites were. We are there for a reason we have been called. We have been called. How cool is that? But it requires us when we are called to recognize that we are sinners, to recognize that we're going to continue to goof up, it, to, to self-reflect. We've got to do it. And then we have to offer it up. The nice thing is we don't have to slaughter a cow or a sheep or a goat or any other animal. Why? Because the law showed us that there was only one sacrifice necessary. The one on the cross. The one who has called us. The one who brings us into this fold. But here's the deal. Once we've accepted the role of priesthood, we can't ignore it. And this is a big one Aaron would tell you. You can't ignore this. Once you've accepted the call, you can't ignore it. You can't just sit on your hands. You can't just sit back. You have to live it. You have to be out there. You have to be. Some of you are going to be out front, but never in front of Jesus. Some of you will be in the middle. Some will be serving from the side. But you can't ignore the call. I have been fascinated over two decades of ministry how many people want to profess faith, and then, that's it. Oh, I'll go to church. Maybe an occasional fellowship. And yet, when we're called to be the priest of all believers, Aaron would tell us, no, this is participatory. This means you got to work. you got to be a producer, not a consumer. You've heard that one before. Aaron would tell you, it doesn't matter what your role is. You can come in from the side. You could be in the center. But you are called. All of you are called. But Aaron would also tell us that there's power in community. There's power in community. There's power in having somebody to walk with. To have a partner, as he and Moses were partners, as his sons were there as partners, as they became priests. They, there, there's something important about finding somebody who is either biologically or spiritually a sibling to walk with. One of the greatest crimes ever perpetuated against the church was back in the late 1970s and 1980s, where it all of a sudden became about personal faith. It's always about personal faith. No, it's never been about personal faith. It's always been about faith and community. Yes, there's a personal component, but you can't do it in a vacuum. You can't do it in a void. And yet, I have met many people along the way who, have t who tell me that their faith is personal, and they work in a void. No, you can't be in a void. You have to be in it together. And to have somebody especially close to you who can not only help you, but also hold you accountable when you mess up. When you mess up, to help you out, to help you reflect. Unfortunately, not unfortunately, Aaron would also tell you, oh, and by the way, the sin doesn't just stop when you accept the call. Later on, Aaron and Moses would be standing there looking at this rock. The people are thirsty. They need a drink. And God says, talk to the rock. Not hit the rock, talk to the rock. They can't wait. They grow impatient. The rock gets a snap the water springs forth. It's called the waters of Meribah. And because of that, this is what God tells Moses and Aaron 
toward the end of their lives. Oh, by the way, I'm going to bring you in sight of the promised land, but you ain't going in because of the waters of Meribah. Aaron would say to you, yes, you will sin. And yes, it'll be with you all your lives. And Aaron would say to you, just keep reflecting. Keep seeking forgiveness. Keep putting yourself at the foot of the cross because Jesus Christ is your sacrifice. But keep focusing on putting yourself at the foot of the cross because God's got you covered. God had us covered back then. God's got us covered now. And God will keep us covered, but we have to share in that. Because we are called. Jesus out front, us marching behind, but us marching together. And God's got us covered. What a wonderful opportunity at the beginning of a new season when there's a freshness in the air before we have gotten our frost out and all of that type of stuff with a new season to remind us that it's yet another season of the priesthood of all believers. That's a long line of people who have walked with Jesus. So I challenge you. I challenge you to challenge yourselves and to allow God to challenge you, to remind you that you have been chosen for this ministry. By God, by our Lord Jesus Christ, you have been chosen. And you are to participate. Because that's how we're going to continue to wander in this wilderness for a little while longer. It's essential that we participate together. So let's do it together. Because that's the best part of this. That we are the body of Christ. My friends, God has us covered. And has had us covered since the beginning. And he will have us covered all the way to the end. So when the trumpets sound and the Lord of light comes forth and calls us all, we can say we answered the call. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we have fellowship today. Um, even though we have buildings in this season, wouldn't it be? Yo, know, we're still inside, John, aren't we? <sighs> today would have been a perfect day to be out in the sunshine. But there's fellowship in Pearson Hall. We hope you all join us. Don't forget, for the kids, we have the bridge. For their parents, come and see Greg and I. We're down in the community room.
My friends, until he comes back for us, we have work to do. We have a sacred call to live. We never do it alone. We do it with one another. But most importantly, we do it with him. So receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his eyes to your eyes and give you peace. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the triune God of grace. Alleluia. Amen.